Hey everyone, welcome to the uh, second week of uh, remote learning. And hopefully last week was um, pretty pretty painless uh, and went pretty smoothly. I, I think it'll get easier as we go along, but obviously let me know if there's any questions you may have. So our, our two content topics this week are our memory, which you'll have two videos, and then the second content topic will be thinking and language, which will have three videos, um, but it will be about the same amount of stuff because um, language uh, itself is, is, is not, as, uh, not as complex as some of the other stuff. But um, so this first topic is on memory, um, which is another one of those things that it's usually pretty fascinating to people. Um, we all, it's a shared experience. We all have memories. We all, um, you know, probably have varying degrees of how well we feel our memory is. I mean, there's some people who seem to remember, uh, you know, everything it seems like, and then there's some that, that can remember what they had for breakfast and it's just, you know, it kind of falls anywhere in between. And, um, you know, uh, that it always brings up just like a lot of other topics in psychology, it brings up the debate of how much of it is, is nature, how much of it's biological that we're born with. And, and also how much of it is, is, uh, is, is taught or a skill that we can learn and, and get better at. So, um, so the, the two, the two videos are going to kind of broken down into, um, the process of memory, which is this first part. Um, and we'll talk about a little couple of different types of memories. Um, and then the second video will be focused on, um, some of the problems with memory or the, the, the issues that can come up with memory, whether it's, false memories or you know, retrieval cue or retrieval failure and not being able to remember things as easily. And um, so it, this first, this first video is mostly going to be on how we go through the process of memories and how they get stored. Um, and then uh, the second video will be more on what happens with those memories, both good and bad, you know, how we use them, what we, um, uh, what we do basically. So, um, so anyway, uh, so let's get it right in. So this first, um, this first slide, uh, and I'm sorry that my ugly mug is covering up this first image over here, but, um, there's really, there's two models quote unquote of memory, um, and, and kind of how the process occurs. Uh, there's the information processing model, which is the most basic and, and, is kind of the, the, if you're just understanding kind of the, the general process of memory, this is the one that, um, this is the one that, uh, you know, is the simplest, uh, but it doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really talk much about the short term, long term, all that. And that's the Atkins and Schifrin model, which will be on the next slide, uh, is more, much more complex. And, and I'll explain that, um, but it's more realistic as well. So this is, this is the very, a very, very basic understanding of how memory works. Basically the, this, this model says there's three steps. There's encoding, storage and retrieval. Encoding is just when we acquire the information to send to our memory. So this is our experiences that we have in our, our conscious awareness that move from consciousness to memory um and uh that that's encoding so when we take what's happening whether it's uh, an, an, an event in our life uh or when we learn like study to learn information like for school both of those can be considered you know encoding and then storage is when that information goes from our conscious level of awareness into our storage whether it's short term or long term and then retrieval is when we take that, mem that that information from memory storage and bring it back into our waking conscious, like our conscious level of awareness. So the, the example I always use for this is, um, you know, when you're making a file like on a computer, um, you know, you listen, if you're if you're typing out a paper, if you're typing out a Word document, like as you're typing all the information that's encoding when you go to save it to your desktop or your personal folder or your USB drive or whatever, that's storage. Like obviously it's, you're storing it. And then when you go the next day or whatever, when you decide to open it back up, that's retrieval. And again, that's a very basic understanding, a very kind of very simplified process, but in a way that's kind of how our memory works. We, we, we 
experience the information, we move it to storage if we choose to or it happens. And then when we want, when we remember it, we bring it from, we retrieve it from storage into our conscious awareness. So, um, so those are the, the, the very, this is a very basic, very basic model. It doesn't take into account um, short term or long term memory. Um, it's just a very, very simplified version of how memory works. Now, this next slide, um, and I know there's a lot of stuff on here, and I'm going to do my best here in just a minute to explain it. But this is called the atkinson Schifrin model, and this takes into account uh, different stages of memory. Um, and uh, the, the, uh, the, the process that it takes from experience and the stages it moves through to get to long-term storage if it gets there, because we don't remember everything that happens to us. We don't remember every single little sensory experience that we have. Some of it is forgotten very quickly, and some of it, whether we make the where whether we make the determination to move it to long term memory or whether it happens automatically through automatic processing, which like I said I'll talk about in a minute, that it move it doesn't just it has to go through these stages. So um this just takes into account the different stages of memory, whereas the information processing model that we just talked about does not. It just says it moves from here to here to here and then that's it. This takes into account more of a uh, process stages type deal in order to get to long term memory. So I'm going to try to explain this image down here at the bottom, which um, it, it, it looks a little more complicated than it is. But I'll do my best here to, to kind of draw on the screen and, and show you guys uh, what I'm what I'm talking about. So. Let me get my pen going here. So this just says that um, there are, uh, you know, a few things that happen. So basically the external events down here in the bottom left, this just saying that that's our conscious awareness. So these three lines going from left to right, that is our sensory input. That's what we see. That's what we hear. That's what we experience. Touch, taste, smell, all that stuff. And as you can see, it, it moves. So when we when we experience that, the sensory input goes into our conscious awareness. The first stage that it enters is what's called sensory memory and sensory memory. Um, and I'll explain all these stages more in just a minute. But sensory memory is a very brief temporary storage of information that is processed in our sensory, uh, our sensory uh, input. So this would be like, it, you know, if we, you know, if you remember what it was like to walk through the halls between classes at school, you know, you hear all of these different conversations happening. Um, off to the side and, and you're aware of them, but that doesn't necessarily mean that five minutes later you're going to remember them. So that's why if you look on the model here at the bottom, you have the three um, you have the three lines moving from left to right here where it says external and sensory and only one goes through after that. And what that's representing is that the vast majority of the information that enters into our sensory memory is gone after a few seconds. Um, and you think about that, like you, you can walk by someone, you hear their conversation that they're having, but it's probably unless it is really important to you or personally relevant or you make the decision to try to remember that, you're probably going to forget it very quickly. So that's what this is showing. So if it goes from sensory memory, then and that's what this kind of thing here. That's a very terrible star that I'm trying to make there. But anyway, like that's what this little note here is saying is that if it's, a, it's an important information or information that's a, a novel detail then you're probably going to remember it easier. But if it moves from sensory memory into work or short term memory and what's sometimes called working memory, and I'll explain the difference about that here in just a minute. Th this is like a little bit longer of a storage site than sensory memory. Sensory memory only lasts a couple of seconds. Short term memory lasts 30 seconds to a minute or so. It's still very short, but we can actually keep information there a little bit longer than sensory information. And we can also rehearse and what's called doing rehearsal and that's keeping that information in your short-term memory so this would be like if someone told you okay i need you to remember these three things to get at the store like if my wife told me to go to the grocery store and said hey i need you to remember these three things and rather than write them down i just repeat them over and over again milk eggs you know soft drinks milk egg soft drinks like that if that's the three things that she tells me to get 
And I just, rather than write them down, I'm afraid I'm going to forget them. I just repeat milk, egg, soft drinks, milk, egg, soft drinks. That's what's called maintenance rehearsal. And that's just keeping it in our short term memory temporarily. Once I stop doing it, it's probably going to go away unless it moves from working or short term memory over to long term memory. And this is um, this is when it has the capability to stay really forever in our memory system. Um, if we can if we're able to access it now when we and what this model is also showing right here is when we retrieve a memory so when we bring it out of long-term memory into our awareness it's actually entering in back into short-term memory and then it goes from short-term and it's a process of short-term to long-term short-term to long-term for as long as we continually remember it and store it um, the only other thing on this model I want to go over is this, this part right here at the top where it says automatic processing. And what this is showing is that sometimes things happen that are so out of the ordinary or crazy or emotional or significant or whatever that they immediately go from the event happening all the way over. It skips all the other stages and goes all the way to long term memory. So this would be something like, you know, it. it it literally was so significant or so emotional or so interesting or so out of the ordinary that you don't need to go through those other stages of sensory and short term. It immediately goes straight into long term because of the the awareness of how significant or important it is. This can be good or bad. This can be memories that are happy memories. Um, this can be memories that are sad memories. It doesn't really matter. But they uh, they they don't go through your normal process like a like a regular kind of process would take place for memory. It immediately goes into that long term um, storage. So anyway, like I said, I was going to go into each of the stages. Um, and uh, since the first stage of sensory memory, like I was saying a minute ago, everything that we that enters into our sensory receptors enters into sensory memory the vast majority of it goes away very quickly the example i use is the conversation example like i said a minute ago you walk past a conversation you're aware of it you may even hear part of it but unless you make the decision to move that information into your short-term memory or further into long-term memory you're probably going to forget it pretty quickly um you know if i'm walking through the you know grocery store or mall or whatever and um I hear a conversation, I may acknowledge what's happening in that conversation, but if you ask me 10 minutes later what what was going on, I may have already forgotten because th this is a very short window of time that this information stays in our memory. Um, and basically the reason that this exists, or at least in theory, the reason that this stage exists is to filter out unnecessary information and keep us from constantly being bombarded with things that we probably don't need to be bombarded with and don't need to remember. Um, it's almost like a, like I said, like almost like a filter for the brain and for our consciousness. Um, it's it's large. It's it's not unlimited. In other words, you know, we can, you know, we can be aware of very a lot of different things happening at once in our sensory information, but it doesn't stick around very long. Normally, a couple of seconds. You can see there, uh, sound, sense, auditory information tends to stick around a little longer than visual information but um this is just showing and, and there's there's different registers iconic and echoic this just means that you know when we're when we hear things or see things if they move from sensory into short term or long term they can get the names of iconic or echoic memories and those are memories that are based on visual or or auditory information um so again um so there's that Second stage of short term memory. This is again, if it moves from sensory into short term, it doesn't mean that it's automatically going to go from short term to long term. But sensory uh, short term memory is a little bit longer than sensory. It's still temporary. Um, and usually this is where it's evaluated. So this would be where you decide, is it important to move on or is it something I just need to remember for a short while and then they get, they can get rid of. Um, and also one key part of this is when we when we retrieve information from our long term memory, it moves from long term memory into our short term memory temporarily. And then if we move it again from short term back to long term, then 
that that it's a process that it continually goes back and forth between short term and long term doesn't mean that we can lose it in short term. It just means that we we retrieve it from long term. It's temporarily in our short term memory while we talk about it, while we think about it. And then it goes back to long term when we're done with it. Um, but this is where it stays after we retrieve it. Um, one thing to, to keep in mind on this on this slide is, is again, this this information right here. And, and I've already got rid of the pen thing. So but uh, I mean, let me see if I can get back, get it back. Here we go. Um, so this this piece right here where it says seven pieces of information, I apparently can't draw on what I'm trying to draw on. But um, but that is just uh, um, but that's just saying that we have a temp kind of in our short term memory, we tend to have about seven plus or minus two pieces of information that we can keep in. And what this means is that if we get a list of like five to nine items, that's about the capacity our short term memory has to remember all of those things. Um, for example, you know, you can unless you have a mnemonic uh, or, or a way to remember really long lists, you're not going to remember them. I can remember all the presidents that our country has ever had. I, I can recite them if necessary. However, I don't do it because I just have memorized one through 45. I had a song. I learned a song when I was a kid that and when I was in elementary school that helped me remember those those presidents. So as I'm reciting them off, all I'm doing is just playing that song in my head. I'm not remembering them from I don't have that list of 45 memorized. I'm reciting off this song in my mind to help me remember because my short term memory is only about five to five to nine things. Seven plus or minus two is what that means. And usually short term memory, unless we rehearse to keep it in there, like I was saying earlier, of repeating information over and over again, it's only about a 30 second to a minute long before it's, it's out of there. Now, if that information moves from short term to long term, then long term memory is, like I said, it's, it's a storehouse of information. It's 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 a we have the capacity to remember anything and everything. The vast majority of us do not. Um, don't ask me the percentage. Don't, I don't know. I don't know what percentage of, of memory that we tend to normally have. However, um, it, it, we have that capacity for unlimited memories. However, we usually don't get to that point. There is a condition, and I usually should, if we were in class, I would show this video. There is a condition called superior autobiographical memory. And this is when people from a certain point in their life, and it's different for everyone that has been diagnosed with it, from a certain point in their life, they remember every single day and the things that happen in that day. Um, so you could ask them, hey, what did you do on April 10th? 1989 if they were if they if it was during that time where they can remember and they would probably be able really quickly to recite off hey well i did i had this for breakfast i did this and and, and that it's incredible that these people are able to do it but the vast majority of us cannot do that i don't remember what i had for breakfast yesterday okay I, oh yeah i do but because i love food but anyway the point is is that most of us don't don't remember you know, these kind of things over and over and over again. Um, but we have the capacity to. That's the main thing. We have the capacity, but we don't have the ability sometimes to do this um, unless you have one of those rare conditions like superior autobiographical memory. Um, and the vast majority of our long term memories stick around really as long as we choose to keep them. And what I mean by that is that if we continually access long term memories, if we continually think about them, they tend to stick around much longer. But that doesn't mean, you know, sometimes we can have just a random memory come back that we completely forgot we had. Um, so, you know, the duration of long term memory can be for the rest of for really for the rest of our lives. Um, OK, so the, the last kind of section of this of this video is going to be on processing memory, like how we move information from different stages into long-term memory and there's really two ways there's automatic and there's effortful and automatic is exactly what it sounds like this is what i was saying earlier when things happen automatically we don't put effort we just remember them they just move from event to long-term storage and um usually this is like i said significant emotional out of the ordinary crazy information that may be or events that 
don't normally happen. So it's, it sticks out and therefore it immediately goes into our long term memory. That doesn't happen terribly often. The vast majority of it is effortful. In other words, we make the effort to move it from event and our conscious awareness to long term storage. And um, we put the effort to transfer it from each stage into short term or long term memory. So, again, automatic happens without us putting effort into it. Effortful processing is us making an effort. This is us deciding, hey, I want to remember this. This is important. I should probably, you know, remember it. And this can be things that are, like I said, this can be things that are significant. You know, this this can be things like, you know, your prom or graduation or whatever. Yes, they're important and they're emotional. But you still, if you don't take, if you just go through it, blah, 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 whatever, like you don't really take the effort to kind of soak it in, you could, you're going to forget some. And, and don't get me wrong. I mean, you're going to forget some of it anyway. I mean, I can attest to that. Like I remember very, very, like various parts of my, you know, prom, graduation, all that. I don't remember every single little thing, even though I was thinking to myself, oh, I sh- you know, this is important. I should remember it. I still don't remember everything. But so even through effortful processing doesn't mean we remember every single little thing. Um, but we are making the effort to move it from event to short term to long term. OK, a couple of different types of memories, explicit memories. Uh, there's there's two types, explicit, implicit. And I'm going to talk about the one, something called flashbulb memories. Explicit memories are sometimes called declarative in other words, these are these are memories that you can talk about explicitly detailed. Don't some people think the word explicit means negative because of the little label that gets put on music that says like explicit lyrics or whatever. That just means it's very clear. It, you know, it's, there's no filter. You can just you know, you can talk about it. You can say, OK, this is what happens. Those are memories that are are not they're not unclear or that they, you know, they're not uh, beneath your conscious awareness. You can talk about them. They're there. And these are kind of, there's two different types of these. There's episodic and, or epi- yeah, episodic and semantic episodic memories are, are the way I remember it is like an episode, quote unquote, like an episode of your life. Like whether it's, you know, like it says there, like first kiss, birthday party, college acceptance, like, uh, they're going back to the prom and graduation that I just mentioned, like those are episodes of your life, like those are episodic memories that you can talk about. And then semantic memories are memories that are these are more kind of book facts. Like these are things that, yes, they're in your long term memory, but they're more just like general knowledge facts, like naming off those 45 presidents I talked about earlier. That, like, that's a semantic memory. That's not I don't have the memory of me learning all 45 presidents. I just know them. That's a semantic memory, but I can still say it. And it's not unclear. So that's a semantic memory. And then implicit memories are sometimes called procedural memory or procedural memories. And these are memories that you don't really have to access specifically in order for them to be used in your mind. For example, like, you know how to ride your bike or you know how to write your name or you know how to tie your shoe, but you may not remember the exact moment that you learned that. However, by learning that, you're able to use it again in the future. So you can access the memories of what you have to do in order to ride a bike or to write your name or whatever. But you may not remember the exact moment in which that occurred. But it's still a, it's an implicit memory. It's a memory, but it's not and it's not the episodic memory of, oh, this is when I learned how to write. This is when I learned how to ride a bike, whatever. Um, and one and one other note here at the bottom is the the sometimes it includes classically conditioned responses to, to stimuli or attitudes like this would be things like you know if you and this is just an example but you know if you grew up this is the attitudes towards different groups like if you grew up with parents who or friends or siblings or whatever who maybe had some attitudes about particular groups whether it's racism sexism whatever and that's just kind of what you were always around then You may have that same belief, but you don't you are not necessarily aware of it because it's just implicit. It's just there because of always being around it or growing up around it. And you access it as if it is a memory that is fact or whatever. Just an example. um, Same thing with like phobias or, you know, you you don't know why you're afraid of spiders or snakes or whatever, but you're, you're afraid of them. So that's an implicit memory as well. And then lastly, and this is the last slide, is uh, flashbulb memories. These are the name flashbulb comes from like being burned into your memory because of it being so emotional. 
because that's what flash bulbs used to do for photography is like help burn in the image into the film or whatever. Um, but these are memories that are so, you know, emotional or significant that you, it strengthens that memory. Like you, you have a very clear memory. And the two examples I put at the bottom here are honestly my personal examples. These are two events that I remember happening from my adolescence that were, you know, very significant. Like, and the one on the left is pretty, I feel like everybody kind of knows what that one is at this point in our, in our lives. But you know, obviously 9-11, I remember exactly where I was when I heard about it, when I saw it on TV, when I saw those towers fall. I have a very distinct memory of that because it was so emotional for a 16 year old kid like it was for me. And then and then the one on the right was a couple of years earlier in 1999. That was the Columbine shooting, which at the time was the deadliest high school shooting in the nation's history at that point. And it was all over the news. And I remember being in I was in middle school about to head into high school when it happened. And um, I remember seeing it on the news and, and all that and having those emotions of fear and, and like, you know, oh, gosh, I'm, I'm going to high school. This, you know, obviously it happened all the way across the country, but still it was something that was significant to me. And, and, it, and, and because, I, you know, and I've, I've always kind of had a fascination with that because it was, you know, like I said, right before I was going into high school and, you know, it had a very significant effect. But I remember, you know, hearing about it, seeing that very distinct memories of both of these events. And, you know, and it can, by the way, flashbulb memories can be positive emotional experiences. I know sometimes we tend to only think of them as like negative, but they can be positive as well. So, um, but again, just know flashbulb memories are the memories that are burned in, quote unquote, because they're so emotional. Um, and because they're so emotional, sometimes that can lead to misinformation. It can lead us where the often are not as accurate as they feel there. It says there at the bottom. That's just saying that, you know, sometimes because we're so emotional, we may not necessarily, um, we may not necessarily remember, um, them as accurately as they were when they actually happened. So because of the emotion. So anyway, um, all right. So that's it for the first video. Um, one more after this, uh, and I'll see you guys then.